Hi, everybody. How's it going? I'm going to start us off. I think word from the box office is that people are still streaming in a bit, but um, I'm going to introduce Patrick, and then hopefully by the time he gets started, everybody will get settled. Uh, so welcome to MPAC. My name is Ashley Farrow murray and I'm the curator of theater and dance, as well as our talks series here. I'm so glad you could all join us, especially given the snow day yesterday. I'm really thankful that Patrick was willing to completely rearrange his schedule at the University of Toronto to stay on with us for one extra day uh, and join us for the talk. And thanks to you all for rearranging your schedules and still being with us. It's great to see a nice audience. Um, so it's, it's a great pleasure of mine to have Patrick here to talk about porn with us tonight. Um, Patrick is a really incredible scholar who works across disciplines, uh, ranging from science and technology studies to human computer interaction, women, gender, sexuality studies. Um, and he is on the Faculty of Information at the University of Toronto and also has affiliations in cin cinema studies department, as well as the technoscience research Institute unit, Technoscience Research Unit, um, which is an interesting kind of cross-disciplinary hub of research on University of Toronto's campus. Um, Patrick also has a bit of a claim to fame, and I am going to read the title of this. Guerrilla Archiving, Saving Environmental Data from Trump, um, is an event that Patrick co-organized last winter, I imagine it was, right? Um, at the University of Toronto with the Technoscience Research Institute and the Women's Studies program there. And it kind of caught uh, media, social media fire and was all over the news channels internationally. Uh, and it was a group of students and faculty who were kind of combing the archives of government websites to try and save data before it was wiped off by the new Trump administration. Um, so in addition to his sexuality studies porn work, he also works across science and technology studies doing all sorts of different projects. With that, I think I'll turn it over to Patrick um, to delight us with his talk, Pornography's Graphical Interface. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Ashley, for inviting me here and for having me. Um, RPI and MPAC have been incredibly generous this whole time, and I want to thank the staff at MPAC for all of the support they've given me and for rearranging their schedules another day, and for all of you for coming today despite the snowy weather. I had my first, ex as a Californian who lives now in an urban environment in Toronto, I actually don't, I don't really experience snow in the way people in upstate New York do. And we got caught in the snow today and had to like push our way out and shovel, I, which was all totally new to me, even though I live in Toronto. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I just want to thank the people who helped us get out of the snow. And I want to thank like the hotel staff for being so generous and re helping me to stay for another day. So yeah, thank you everyone. Thanks very much. Um, <clears throat> so I'll just start by reading, I guess, a kind of abstract to the talk. And the talk comes in two parts. And the first part is going to be about sort of the experience uh, that these designs are intended to create. And then we'll talk about um, the actual design elements. Um, right, so this paper examines the strategic interface designs of online pornography websites that pull viewers into a trance-like flow that requires no complex cognition. Viewers constantly shift to new images, creating a process of browsing in which pleasure derives uh, from the habitual and repetitious delay and deferral of satisfaction. Within this flow, viewers are absorbed in the process of browsing online, blurring the distinction between human and machine. Um, in contrast to mechanistic understandings of design, which focus on feedback loops that minimize frustration and maximize satisfaction and efficiency, uh, which you might assume the porn industry would also do, um, the design of pornographic video streaming sites is labyrinthine, rambling, and chaotic, creating an environment for wandering, bra browsing, and meandering. Um, such an approach to design recognizes, and I'll obviously explain all this throughout the talk, a probabilistic interaction with interface that reveals interface as a cultural value system that finds expression in the graphical organization of information. So before I get into all of that, um, I'll also just provide some um, 
brief context about the larger project that this is a part of um, and about the sort of online pornography and uh, industry. And if in the Q&A you want me to go into more detail about what that industry looks like today because it doesn't look like the Deuce, the HBO uh, show uh, that's become really popular and it really doesn't even look like what it looked like 10 years ago. Um, and in some ways it doesn't even look like what it looked like three years ago. So if you want me to sort of map that political economy, I'm more than happy to do that in the Q&A. Um, my broader project brings together theories of desire and the technical science of design to examine strategic choices made by back-end developers, that is software developers, interface designers, and data scientists working in the online pornography industry. Within this industry, back-end developers are tasked with increasing viewers' immersion and retaining the attention um, uh, of website visitors in order to infer categories of sexual desire upon people in two ways. First, through large surveillance network of a uh, web analytics software, and second, so through sophisticated algorithms based largely on web surfing habits. So specifically, the study asks, how does the pornography industry design for desire? Um, uh, how does this differ from similar practices in other industries, and what can theories of desire add to um, our understanding of these systems? Um, to, answer the, uh, to answer these questions, I focus on the process by which backend developers make these strategic choices about algorithms, interface, streaming software, and database management systems. Um, and that comes through a three-prong methodology that includes a visual analysis of websites, and you'll see some of that today, um, in-depth interviews, and I just spent two weeks in Las Vegas with a bunch of pornographers, which is a lot of time in Vegas with that community. Uh, <laughs> at day seven, I had hit my limit, I think. <clears throat> and textual analysis of technical literatures through the, the theoretical lens of desire. Um, so the study explores the role of design in both intensifying traffic between humans and machines, um, further blur blurring the line between design and experience, bodies and capital, autonomy and automation, compulsion and control. Um, while most pornography fo studies focus on the representational or historical aspects of the industry, this study focuses on the industry's current technological context by examining three of the largest online pornography companies today, uh, or at least distributors, um, Pornhub, Xvideo, and Xhamster. The profit motives of the pornography have long driven new forms of media and technological innovation, including the development and proliferation of cable television, VCR, Blu-ray, broadband, and 3G mobile services. And uh, for VCR, I would encourage you to read this new book that's out called Smutty Little Movies um, that basically trace, it's, it's basically the history of VHS um, and VCR rental technologies, which cannot really be written with, without, with, it's only basically written by telling us history of porn. Um, in recent years, the industry has driven the development of web technologies and online business practices, such as hosting services, live chat, secure credit card processing, um, banner advertisements, pop-up web promotions, mouse trapping, um, the whole like one-click purchase that Amazon's really good at now, also uh, porn originally, and streaming video technologies. So why these companies? Well, Pornhub, Xvideo, and Xhamster are not only streaming sites. Um, they're sophisticated technology companies that develop unique data mining and data analytics software that inscribe identity categories based on perceived sexual desires. They also sell that um, data to third parties, and we can talk a little bit about their revenue streams. Um, uh, they're, they're part of really sort of mega conglomerate corporations, multinational corporations. Um, MindGeek, for example, is based in Luxembourg, but it owns studios throughout the world. And so if we can talk a little bit more about just how big and, and how interoperable and um, you know, multinational all of this is. Um, they're part of a $97 billion industry whose revenues in the US alone exceed baseball, basketball, and football combined. Each of these companies employs hundreds of back-end developers um, who design these interfaces and, uh, as well as data scientists who create the techniques for um, mining that data. Um, each website boasts an average of more than 50 unique users per day, making each of them among the top 100 and on certain days top 50 most frequently visited websites globally. Pornhub's parent company, MindGeek, owns most of the major pornographic video streaming sites, and as I say, as well as certain kinds of um, 
uh, traffic networking companies. Um, uh, they also own uh, secure uh, uh, payment processing and studios, among others. By some estimates, MindGeek distributes 80% of all pornographic video streaming content online. Those are their estimates, but I've never really seen anybody dispute that. And so we, I mean, we, we're sort of taking them at their word. Whether we should do that or not is obviously an open question. Headquartered in Luxembourg, MindGeek made its money by buying up a slew of pornographic video streaming sites and studios, including Pornhub, a Montreal-based streaming site that is the largest and most profitable site of its kind. Um, and as I say, we can talk more about that in the Q&A, about just what the money looks like and how it flows. Um, uh, just... Uh, da, 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 sorry. And we can also, oh yeah, the other thing I was going to say, we can talk about why in the 90s in Toronto and Montreal in particular these companies came to prominence. Um, MindGeek's employees are based in a treeless, nondescript um, office uh, park in Montreal. The ordinariness of the glass office building built in the 1990s, complete with cubicle farm and beige walls, belies the fact that it's the world's largest distributor of pornography. And they went through a period um, a few years ago where they decided to completely refurbish the building inside, and now it's got this sort of high gloss white, um, like sort of uh, super modern, hyper modern feel. Because they're a tech company, they're not a porn company. Um, X Videos and X Hamster, based in Las Vegas and Houston, respectively, are independently owned yet significant in size. Along with Pornhub, they round out the three uh, largest pornography distributors online. The design of pornographic video streaming sites, including their graphical organization, the algorithms, database management systems, reveals the graphical organization of pornographic content as a cultural value system that structures and regulates individual sexual desires. For many designers, pornographic streaming sites are often a good example of poor design because of their seemingly chaotic nature. As you'll see from the talk, however, these designs are highly strategic and make a difference to prevailing understandings of design and immersion in psychology, graphical interface design, and human-computer interaction. They also help us understand one of the largest and most profitable industries behind a data-driven capitalist media landscape. So we'll get into the dark side of flow. That's where we'll start. Um, flow provides an escape from the chaos of the quotidian, wrote uh, psychologist Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi. Csikszentmihalyi popularized the term flow to describe states of absorption in which attention is so narrowly focused on an activity that a sense of time and the concerns of daily life fade away. Citing the work of Emil Durkheim on collective effervescence, Victor Turner on ritual, and Albert Einstein on the value of art and science as forms of escape that create new realities, Csikszentmihalyi argues that culture evolves through flow experience. While Csikszentmihalyi largely understood flow as a positive state, one that's life-affirming, restorative, and enriching, he also acknowledged that flow is potentially addictive, <clears throat> inventing, in, inviting dependency to suspend uh, negative emotional states such as fear, boredom, apathy, anxiety, confusion, and jealousy, what he calls psychic entropy. For Csikszentmihalyi, dependency on flow derives from an individual's propensities rather than uh, any specific properties of a given flow activity. Compulsive flow, he argues, stems from the motivation behind it rather than the medium facilitating it. As Natasha Scholl succinctly, in, in her, this is the flow book, and this is Natasha Scholl's fantastic ethnography of gambling in Las Vegas. <clears throat> As uh, Natasha Scholl distinct, uh, succinctly puts it in her study of machine gambling, uh, for chick sent me high, whether escape turns forward or backwards has to do with its subjects rather than its objects. Um, but as Scholl contends in her book, to characterize flow as a condition of subjective impasse is apt but incomplete. Instead, compulsive flow is a condition that develops out of a sustained interaction between subject and object. Both sides of the interaction matter. Absorptive uh, activity follows a mediational logic. logic. It cannot be located discreetly in the subject or the object, but rather in the dynamic, probabilistic, and performative interaction between the two. Latour, Bruno Latour famously uh, uh, describes the mediational logic in responding to the NRA slogan that guns don't kill people by arguing that objects are never simply inanimate. Latour writes, you are different with a gun in your hand. <clears throat> the gun is different with you holding it. You are a subject because you hold the gun. 
The gun is another object because it has entered a relationship with you. For Latour, neither guns uh, nor people kill people. Killing is an action they can only produce together, each mediating the other. Don Ida has characterized this approach to the study of technology as a phenomenology of human technology, um, uh, uh, or yeah, a phenomenology of human technology, Vivian Sobchak has described it as existential phenomenology. Such an approach avoids the materialist tendency to treat technology as an autonomous determining force, as well as of human-centered approaches that tend to regard technology as inanimate or neutral. Instead, following Latour, objects and subjects act together through their encounters with each other, a co-production. The design of online pornography websites produces this co-production in ways that are significantly different than many popular and scholarly understandings of our immersive interactions with electronic technology, particularly gambling, social networks, and online game companies. According to these understandings, immersion occurs through qualities of design that turn a potentially bumpy ride into a smooth ride. And that was one of the assertions in Scholl's study. New York Times business reporter Natasha Singer characterizes these design qualities as slick, pleasing features, and easy. Singer finds that designers do not intend for their design techniques to broaden companies' consumer base, but to retain the people you already have, according to Sean Ellis, a chief executive at um, growthhackers.com, a software company specializing in online growth techniques. Um, for Scholl, um, Dedicated machine gamblers prefer uninterrupted flow so that players cease to register events as discontinuous or even to distinguish them from their own inclinations. According to this logic, immersion occurs when players are unencumbered by excessive stimuli, such as pop-up advertisements, or when the immediacy of the machine's response joins human and machine in, hermetically clo in a hermetically closed circuit of action, such that the locus of control and thus of agency become indiscernible. For Scholl, the, the immediacy, exactness, and consistency of response between player and stimulus um, and game response in machine gambling is an instance of perfect contingency. I should have warned you just before I show the next slide that this is where the graphic content begins. And I even forgot to mention at the start of the talk that this talk will, in fact, um, include um, graphic images as a pornography talk. So now here we begin with the graphic images. <clears throat> I even wrote a note to myself, and I don't know why that just went out my brain. Um, <clears throat> like the interface of machine gambling, the design of online pornography websites enables repeating loops of bodily inputs and outputs that require little complex cognition. However, many pornography websites provide an overflow of images and textual fragments, as I said earlier, seemingly arranged in a rambling and chaotic fashion, opposed to concepts of ordering and system. Alongside the myriad of pornographic images on display, these sites also frequently feature pop-ups, advertisements, banner advertisements, which, they, <coughs> which the industry had um, helped pioneer, flash animated GIFs, um, and even still to this day, even though it's not the 90s anymore, some of them still feature background music. Um, pretty remarkable. Uh, many pornography websites provide an enormous range of selection that seems to promise satisfaction, um, a kind of pornocopia effect. This concept of design participates in an aegis of getting what you want, but in excess of it. In this way, pornography websites promise the accessible and visible while delivering a kind of like curiosity and something that's obscure. Um, such a method of display is an aesthetic tr contrivance that draws wonder, curiosity, surprise, even frustration from the viewer. And I'll talk a little bit more about that frustration. It's part of a kind of Baroque genealogy of display, creating differential relations between embodiment and technics by placing body and machine, sensation and concept, nature and artifice in ongoing relations of discordance and concordance with each other. The goal of getting what you want in part allows the viewer to rationalize the pleasure of searching. To imagine the goal is to project into a moment of perfect satisfaction, obtaining the perfect image, one adequate to the viewer's desire, yet nothing can compare to an imagined perfect image, leaving every image inadequate. The nearly perfect image <clears throat> still only provides momentary satisfaction even if the viewer knows they are unlikely to find a better image, they continue to browse, foregoing the pleasures of the known for the pleasures of the unknown. 
the search continues, satisfaction's elusive. In deferring satisfaction, desire reproduces itself as desire, and that's a sort of basic concept from psychologist um, Jacques Lacan. Viewers constantly shift to new images, creating a process of browsing in which pleasure derives from the habitual and repetitious delay and deferral of satisfaction. <clears throat> While the myth of the internet promises immediate gratification, um, and some might even argue the myth of, of online pornography promises that it will, um, the interface of online pornography necessitates delays. And some of these are just sort of basic delays online, logging on, finding a site, clicking through, or swiping on a mobile device, loading thumbnails, waiting for a selected image, series of images, or moving images to appear, compounded by the limited capacity of silicon to conduct electrons at particular speeds. A high-speed internet may decrease this delay, um, but as Patterson shows, cyber porn constantly pushes the boundaries of bandwidth. Um, and that's Zabet Patterson, who's a, um, she actually teaches not far from here, um, who's a sort of a new media uh, art scholar. Um, a high-speed internet may increase this, uh, 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 may decrease this delay, but <clears throat> cyber porn constantly pushes the boundaries of bandwidth. As soon as the technology can immediately deliver full-frame images, streaming video comes on offer with slower load times. <clears throat> One wonders what will happen with VR. Even with a high-speed connection, there is still often delay on the site of the site delivering content. Waiting and looking become habit, thereby inscribing repetition and delay as pleasures of a different order. Um, as Roland Bart reminds us in his analysis of the striptease, delay intensifies the pleasure of eventual visibility. The mechanics through which one views online porno pornography insist on certain movements of the body, which become habit through repetition, pointing and clicking, pushing the refresh button, scrolling up and down, left and right, opening and closing windows, clicking back and forward, right clicking, fast forwarding through scenes, slowing scenes down, pausing a moving image, all of which requires moving the mouse to a precise point on a surface. Performing these gestures represents the pre-existing relation between body and machine, and they're also all taken into um, enormous consideration in, in the design of these sites, and I'll get to that in a, a little while later. While these gestures might, seem, might, might be seen as highly interactive, enabling control and manipulation of images, uh, Mizuki, Mizuko Ito has shown in her studies of interactional game design that counterintuitively, the effect is to bring about states of absorptive automaticity rather than reflective decision making. Masturbation's a good example, though not the only one, of absorptive automaticity that collapses the kinds of distinctions between subject and object that I'm, <clears throat> uh, that I'm sort of describing here. Unlike Scholl's analysis of machine gambling, in which the most extreme of machine gamblers speak of bodily exit, suggesting that disembodied is a more apt descriptor for their relationship with technology than embodied, the pornographic experience is meaningful to viewers precisely because of their bodies. To the extent that it attempts to arouse sexual feelings, pornography functions in and through a direct visceral appeal to the body. Touching in pornography, the, the smooch of a kiss, the touch of a shoulder, becomes actualized as the touch of one's self, an auto-effective touch, which um, in the way, much in the way Alfonso Lingus describes sensing one's own sensuality, or Merleau-Ponty describes the sense of touch as diffused into the body. This form of self-touching is consciously other-directed, and as such, one might argue it maintains the kind of subject-object distinction because it's different from forms of self-touching in which one's body and one's consciousness is um, uh, self-directed. However, one's consciousness is never entirely self-directed, for masturbation um, de demands special focus on an external, if also imaginary, figure of desire. It is precisely because one's consciousness is not directed toward one's own body, but toward the figure on screen, that the subject and object remain interlaced rather than distinct. In such a moment, consciousness is diffuse, embodiment dispersed. The viewer is, according to Vivian Sobchak, a film scholar, caught up without a thought because my thoughts are elsewhere in this vacillating and reversible structure that both differentiates and connects um, the sense of the literal body to the sense of the figurative bodies um, and objects I see on screen. Solicited by figural objects on screen, viewers are not focused on the particularities of their own literal bodies either. And in fact, Carolyn Dinshaw, who's this really famous sort of 
uh, film scholar of horror films, has a similar reading of horror films, of being sort of caught up in horror films and the sort of grasping of the seat as you're watching it. And there's this way in which you become, you, I mean, you get caught up in, right, um, not wanting to see somebody killed and you become really sort of anxious in those moments. Um, and of course, we just take it for granted that that's all designed in film. Um, so a, a diffusion of the fideral, figural and literal reflects diffusion of presence and telepresence. In this context, the viewer's interaction heightens and intensifies their senses. Oh, I'm sorry. The, in this context, the viewer's perception of the figure on screen and their sense of self are vague, even as the interaction heightens and intensifies their senses. At the moment, one's lived body in rebound senses itself in the online pornography experience. The, per the, the particular objects that essentially provoke the viewer are perceived in diffuse ways. One's body is the site where the central event of representation occurs, where the sexual solicitation by the figural on screen, figure on screen and one's own self-touching becomes diffused into one's body. Thus, the literal body and the figural bodies on screen are both differentiated and connected. A dialectic of sexual engagement and a hyper-awareness of one's own body spilling over or onto another. For Scholl, this is the moment at which players do not act on the game, but become the game by entering what she calls the machine zone, a state in which alterity and agency recede. A, f a form of autoeroticism in which one's body and one's consciousness are totally self-directed requires such cognitive reflection and attention toward oneself, what Sabchak calls a kind of double reflexivity, that it can and often does undo carnal pleasure. And um, for this example, uh, Shabsak points out that it's nearly impossible to tickle oneself for self-consciousness of our laughing um, results in it becoming forced. The process of browsing porn online collapses the distinction between subject and object insofar as browsing for sexual representation participates in perceptual rebound. At the moment, the search reflects sexual desire itself as necessarily other-directed and requires an object other than oneself so as to avoid a reflexivity that is so doubled as to cause conscious reflection on desire, on sexual desire itself. Browsing porn fails to be pleasurable at the moment it becomes consciously reflective. Compulsive desire depends on, auto, on absorptive automaticity. In these moments, one does not think about one's own body thrust outside of the on-screen image. Instead, viewers are consumed by the image. They feel their bodies as only one side of an irreducible and dynamic relational structure of reversibility and reciprocity that has as its other side the figural body on screen. This form of flow is an immersive exchange that allows viewers actually to feel the warmth, moisture, and smoothness of a body. So we're gonna talk now, and uh, we're now gonna talk about the sort of design elements that make all of this high theory possible. Um, not makes that theory possible, but makes these sensations possible. Um, so we're gonna talk about how they design for these kinds of flows. Based on experiments testing short-term memory and the capacity to follow cues from one screen to another, Ben Schneiderman's eight golden rules offer common sense principles that have come to guide interface design, such as permit easy reversal of action, offer simple error handling, and enable frequent users um, to use shortcuts. These seem like good principles. Working closely with engineers and software uh, developers, interface designers are mostly task-oriented, focused on feedback loops that minimize frustration and maximize satisfaction and efficiency. This mode of design, as we've seen from Scholl's study, transforms a bumpy ride into a smooth ride. Interface designers translate user needs into functional requirements in which concepts of prototype and user feedback and design are locked, and design thinking, are locked into iterative cycles of task specification and deliverables. This language, writes Johanna Drucker uh, in this book, um, comes from a platform of principles in the software industry. Deliberately mechanistic, it promotes the idea of a user instead of that of a humanistic subject. And I have all kinds of ideas about the word user and its various histories. <laughs> but we don't have to get into that today. Um, Drucker shows that interface designers tend to chunk tasks and behaviors into carefully defined segments that abstract our engagement with interface from any hint of ambiguity. 
In his theory for visual interface design, Mauro Minnelli lays out a mechanistic approach to evaluating effective design from forming an interaction and specifying an action to evaluating an outcome. Concerned with the structure of design, that is, the placement of buttons, the amount of time it takes to perform a task, how we move through screens, Minnelli's approach reflects a design process in, re in relation to the concept of user experience that attempts to map a direct relation between structure and effect. This is akin, as English scholars will tell you, to doing a close reading of a text's formal features as if it locked that text into the reading. Such an approach to interface design is reductively mechanistic. Its goal is to design an environment to maximize efficient accomplishment of tasks by individuals who are imagined as autonomous agents whose behaviors can be constrained in a mechanical feedback loop. By contrast, the graphical interface of pornographic streaming sites with their labyrinthine quality of design implicitly challenge this concept of design by creating an environment for wandering, browsing, meandering, or prolonging engagement for the purpose of pleasure or even the lower level notation of keeping boredom at bay or idle distraction and time squandering. Pornographic video hosting services such as Pornhub and Xtube, RedTube, Uporn, Xhamster create a space of dwelling, not merely a realm of control panels and instruments. They're often disruptive, disorienting, and frustrating in their defeat of expectations. As such, the graphic interface of online pornography must be thought beyond representation toward ecology, a zone between cultural systems and human subjects, the interspace between information space and a task-supporting environment. For Drucker, this is neither the self-evident map of content elements and their relations, nor is it simply a way to organize tasks. Pornographic video hosting services challenge the illusion of the interface as a static presentation of a thing, revealing instead that it's an active dynamic field of forces acting on each other within a frame of constraint to produce the conditions that provoke the constitutive act of viewing by which one experienced graphic design. I realize that's a long sentence. In this sense, the graphical elements of online pornography are probabilistic entities, subject to constrained but intermediate possible interactions. The act of viewing is what constitutes the event, gives it determinate form from its potential, governed by, by graphic, governed by its graphical organization, the specific individual viewing experience produces a performance of that environment. This mode of design cannot be understood merely in terms of expectations of performance, tasks, and behaviors. Websites such as Pornhub and Xtube, two of the largest pornographic video streaming sites, reveal an approach to design that recognizes a probabilistic interaction with interface. This understanding of probability borrows from Mary Carruthers to suggest graphical interface is performed when it's looked at, viewed, or experienced. And what's interesting about Carruthers is she's actually a scholar of medieval English, and she's studying illuminated pages for understanding graphic design. And when she originally wrote her books on um, the sort of uh, organization of thought in the Middle Ages, she had no idea that it would actually become influential in some graphic design circles. Um, Norman Long describes interface as a critical point of interaction between life worlds. And Brenda Laurel defines interface as a surface where the necessary contact between interactors and tasks allow functions to be performed. For Laurel, the interface is a site of power and control, a dynamic space in a psychoanalytic sense, not just a psychological one. Graphical interface is an artifact of processes and protocols the, that is not only a zone in which our behaviors and actions take place, but also a cultural value system. Every aspect of web content management and display embodies values, even if these are largely ignored or treated as transparent or invisible. Point of view, for example, um, works to embody the subject whose positions organize the work around a gaze. And as with any image, graphic interfaces have a point of view that a subject enunciates and produces, a constitutive perspective from which the viewer is situated, made, and from which the viewer perceives. Images are drawn from some place in relation to what is shown. As in any enunciative system, our subjectivity is as much an effect of what we cannot say, what cannot be done, the constraints on behavior and imagination, as of what we do and can perform directly. The graphical interface of online pornography is such a disciplinary tool. The organizational discourse of pornographic video streaming sites, I'll just show you 
some more of these um, websites. The organizational sort of discourse of pornographic video streaming sites lends itself to viewing across modalities, creating a media convergence that includes animation, GIFs, live action, graphic design, and sound, to name only a few. In this sense, online pornography is much more mutable than classic understandings of film and video. Viewers immediately engage with multiple media simultaneously when they land on a, on a porn streaming site. Pornhub, XTube, RedTube, you porn X hamster, all of these feature, not coincidentally, similar interface design, animated GIFs in rows and columns juxtaposed with a distracting live action advertisement on the right hand side of the screen, the effect of which is to draw the viewer's eye clockwise, beginning with the company's logo and search box in the upper left hand corner across the page to the live action advertisement, then back to the rows of animated GIFs. And we'll just watch these animations. So there will be now be animation. <laughs> you have to warn people at every step. Um, right, so this, you can sort of see my, there's a pointer here. You can sort of see my cursor as it scrolls. And the point of this is to show you how these um, images animate as you scroll across them. Right, and then you can see, of course, the live action um, advertisement. This is valuable real estate. And you can imagine, I mean, if just like in, just like the way real, or I shouldn't call it real estate, I guess, but just like the way space in a newspaper for advertisers is priced differently, right? The same kind of idea on, uh, in the porn industry. Um, so again, uh, another example from a different company. This is of course Pornhub. I'm sure several of you are familiar already with this site. Um, and that I am showing you things you know very well. Um, but same design strategy, and um, these are not companies that are all owned by the same mega conglomerate, right? Um, but you can see how when we scroll, things uh, act in a kind of dynamic relation to each other. And the way it just, this kind of like continuous scrolling, this kind of abundance and overflow. Um, so we'll move on to the next. Uh, and even for gay porn, similar strategy, right? Great. The result is a cyclical viewing pattern that compels viewers to browse the entire space, to take in the volume of videos well known to designers of other consumer spaces such as supermarkets, department stores, malls, and perhaps the epitome of this design, Ikea. We're going to talk about IKEA. The spaces are designed to give viewers routes to follow while distracting them with an abundance of products. In doing so, this mode of design promises satisfaction while delivering unintelligibility and disorientation in order to remove one's sense of autonomy and intentionality through capital uh, productive distractions. Um, yeah, I have a footnote for any art historians in the room, but I don't think I need to do that. <laughs> for, this, for this talk. Um, paradoxically, this technique encourages attention retention through distraction. However, unlike IKEA, which is governed by temporal principles of moving forward in a unidirectional manner, and we can talk about the shortcuts because they're not actually an exception, um, the temporalities of video streaming sites are varied. The refresh rate of banner advertisements, GIFs, and live action advertisements is different. So too is a viewer's cognitive processing and manipulation of that experience. Viewers can follow links, watch an animated GIF, open a series of windows, jump from page to page, and so on. Unlike the controlled experience in the classic account of cinematic spectatorship, reading a graphic novel, or performing the discontinuous reading of a book or newspaper, the experience of viewing pornography online has no a priori unifying ground on which these fragments relate. The exterior frame of an image, the defining frame that delimits its boundaries, is much more porous and fragile in a web environment. Viewers can read across modalities. 
The different points of connection, as Drucker has shown, are best understood through mathematical and spatial metaphors, and we often use these in graphic design online. Nodes, edges, tangents, trajectories, hinges, bends, portals. This is not to impose the language of old media on new or to develop a language that arrives from pastiche allegory or appropriation. This is mostly for the media archaeologists who might be in the room, but simply to describe the structuring principles that refer to the experience of reading and interface. Live action and GIFs function together as an aesthetic contrivance to create a rambling and chaotic sensory overflow that the images have been arranged in rows and columns, ostensibly gives viewers a sense of method and control for navigation. Um, as viewers roll their on-screen cursor over the images, the images flash pixelated clips GIFs and thumbnails of a longer video to which the images link. The result is an interactive environment in which viewers feel they can control and manipulate images into animation, yet the sense of interaction also serves to draw the viewer further into navigation, into a labyrinth of serendipitous discovery. When a viewer clicks on an animated GIF, a new web page opens featuring a live action clip alongside a dizzying array of new advertisements and more rows and columns of animated GIFs algorithmically determined to relate to the featured clip. So much of this is algorithmically determined by tra tracking browsing patterns. And then um, they literally measure like what, 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 what is the behavior? What kinds of clicks will we get by putting these images together? By putting these images together, this one below it, that one aside, on, alongside of it, or what, this, the, what the page will look like as you scroll. So an enormous amount of thought goes into all of that. Um, yeah, da, 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 where did I leave off? Um, right, viewers are thus presented with an entirely new set of images to navigate. If a feature clip doesn't fit a viewer's imagined perfect image, one completely adequate to their desire, they're invited to shift to any number of other GIFs featured on the page, thereby foregoing the pleasures of the known for the pleasures of the unknown. The process structures pleasure, of course, as the delay and deferral of satisfaction through browsing, and it incrementally intensifies the elements of surprise. That the featured clip is still only a clip and not the full-length video serves to reinforce the fragmented and partial nature um, of satisfaction that this design seeks to induce. Try to remember if this is also an animated one. Yeah. So this is, um, I think, showing the scrolling. And at some point, I believe in one of them, I click on a video. And then you can see the, the way it invites you to click on more videos if you don't like this video. Um, the amateurish or consumer grade quality of both. Yeah. So that's what's happened here. I'll, I'll pause and explain what's happening in the end. So we've clicked on a video. Supposing we don't like this video, we're invited to click on anything else. I mean, there's just the abundance is, right, the, the point of the design. There's so much here. Why would you ever want to leave? Um, the amateurish or consumer grade qualities of both the design of these websites and the videos they feature work together to create a sense, a sense of intimacy and authenticity between viewer and graphical organization that creates slippage between amateur, professional, and fan. And there's some really great examples of this. Um, while ease of use and minimalism are frequently associated with quality web design, some pornographic video streaming sites trade in less polished forms of display that reflect the aesthetics of homemade videos uploaded by fans to the site. Yet this mode of, and many of these feature right videos by fans to the site. Um, Yet this mode of display is anything but amateurish. The design of these sites, as I've shown, are the result of strategic choices made by designers interested in time on site and attention retention. Xtube and Xhamster are particularly good examples of the way consumer grade design, I don't know what else to call it, um, functions to create a sense of intimacy between viewers, the graphical organization of the site, and the site's content. A large number of the GIFs on these websites feature gonzo, close-up, or medium shots that transform point of view, um, that transform the point of view of traditional pornography from voyeur to participant, dwelling in the scene or taking part in the action. Some professionally shot videos nowadays feature amateur aesthetics in order to sort of capitalize on, on this, uh, 
the emergence of these sites. Unsteady camera movements, small aspect ratios, or cropping around the, what they call the tidal safe area. Actual amateurs on cell phones with grainy aesthetics and grim lighting, a mise-en-scene, a vertical blinds and beige couches also upload their own videos to the sites. And in fact, in Vegas, they talked about just like how large the industry is now for like a kind of documentary quality or realistic uh, porn. Just the kind of like less hyper real, I guess, porn. Um, <laughs> Xtube feature further collapses the distinction between amateur and professional by allowing individuals to charge viewers to access their homemade videos and images, thereby incentivizing interaction, intimate relation between the site content and viewers. Um, both amateur and professional videos displace and decenter classical framing, composition, and perspectival arrangement as traditional aesthetic goals in filmmaking, opting instead for shots that allow the figural bodies on screen to feel more proximate to the viewer's literal body in the flesh. And I've described that above, the way masturbation participates in, in furthering distributing this intimacy um, and collapsing this, the distinction between subject and object. Um, the consumer grade quality of these videos fits neatly within the unpolished composition of the graphical organization of porn pornography um, on X Tube and X Hamster. The dimension of white space around the videos and text create a field that has a certain weight, heft, and gap that has a vectorial force distinguishing one element from another in a broader graphical system as a whole. The dimensions uh, of the video, the dimensions of border space, even typographic choices for textual descriptors all contribute to the sort of busy aesthetic, uh, the busyness, busyness aesthetic of the page and the disorientation of its graphical overflow. These graphical elements are signaling functions that only have value because they're within a conditional whole. Like word breaks and line endings, these, so if you're an English major, those are sort of traditional, um, uh, I guess, uh, aesthetic elements, formal elements uh, that we often look at for reading. Um, so like word breaks and line endings, um, these are devices and conventions on which we depend. They work, act, and have behavioral function in relation to their presence on the page. The habits of navigating this rambling and chaotic mode of display lend themselves to a fan's sensibility, pleasure in serendipitous discovery, sleuthing out the imagined perfect image, the pleasurable frustration of slow load times, the heightened pleasure of eventual visibility. With only a little effort, viewers quickly develop browsing strategies for navigating a site's graphical organization. Professional and amateur pornography also have in common a limited narrative framework and a mise-en-scene that not only serves to collapse distinctions between the two, but also lends itself to the fragmented clip format of online video streaming sites and viewers' probabilistic interactions with those videos. In fact, many pornography studios now produce their films with the clip format of video hosting services in mind. And in fact, uh, one of the things I'm, I'm recently discovering is just how many studios are also producing content with um, things like the techniques of, of, of uh, algorithmic curation, collecting browsing patterns, the tagging, all the categories that are created for these sites. Um, there's a way in which certain kinds of database logic are now um, being taken up in determining what kinds of content should be produced so that it fits neatly within both the graphic design and the kinds of logics of, da of databases. It's just mine, I just sort of, I find that one of the most fascinating things happening today. Um, while pornography has never been known for its complicated narratives, right? Um, the clip format posits a video's own narrative incompleteness, enabling the imaginative possibilities of fantasy narratives that viewers might project through the scene. The fragmented narrative arc of online pornography is therefore productively limited. Because these clips are based on tropes that have occurred over decades, they take advantage of generic knowledge. Consider, for example, and these are all mainly uh, gay examples, um, but consider, for example, a clip that features a mise-en-scene of a hotel room pizza box and two men having sex. Viewers need little else to imagine the well-known pornographic narrative of a pizza delivery boy mistakenly delivering to the wrong room. 
or a mise en scene that features an old man and a younger man having sex in a locker room, viewers need little else to imagine a potentially sort of like coach player relationship or simply uh, um, two men with an orange traffic cone, Co construction fantasies abound. Um, viewers are able to nip, and you can see some of these examples here, right? The locker room narrative, it's just simply two guys with lockers behind them. This one is just literally like guys with orange, ha with yellow hats on. I mean, that's the entire, that's the entire, um, the overhead is obviously quite low. Um, and this is the pizza delivery scene um, with, I think, Brent Corrigan. I don't know if any of you follow porn, but um, which of course you do. But um, uh, so viewers don't need much to sort of project those fantasies through the image because it takes advantage of generic knowledge. Um, viewers are able to manipulate the sequence of the video, jumping within the video, pausing, fast forwarding, rewinding at any point without disrupting the imaginative possibilities that a scene with such a limited narrative provides. And of course, as I say, while the limited narrative framework and mise en scène of online pornography reflects attempts by studios to lower production costs, these examples acknowledge a kind of probabilistic viewing of pornography. They function semiotically to provide a set of constraints and possibilities into which a viewer can project their, their particular narrative fantasy. Viewers perform the video when they experience it, and, they ex and the experience of the video constitutes it. I'm going to end my talk there. I have a kind of like highfalutin conclusion, but I think I'll um, save that for the sort of art historians and, and uh, human humanities scholars. Thank you very much. Thank you, Patrick. Um, so I think that we have some time for a couple of questions, if anybody. Yes, right back there. And I'm going to ask you to just speak loudly. But if you can't hear, I can also pass around a microphone. I sort of have the 51% question. Right. Are the design considerations different for trying to draw women into pornography as opposed to men? Um, that's a great question. Uh, these sites, I don't think, take that into consideration, except that you're, it's oftentimes what you see is based on um, your browsing patterns. And uh, whether or not that correlates to a traditional identity category is actually really um, something that people are still exploring further, because so often um, it's creating a kind of new identity for you that's a kind of like algorithmic identity rather than an identity that maps easily onto like a census um, study. So I don't know that it breaks down as easily as saying this is, we're going to design this this way for women or this way for men when so much of your browsing identity is based on something that's algorithmically generated. Um, but I will say that um, women viewers are considered the largest growing, of course, because uh, uh, otherwise, right? Uh, <laughs> but women are considered one of the largest growing consumers of pornography. And the industry is increasingly appealing to that uh, market. Um, yeah, so, which, is which actually makes the relationship between the porn industry and the adult novel industry and sort of feminist bookstores and feminist sex toy stores really interesting because they have been doing that for decades. And those kinds of marketing strategies are now um, being taken up in certain areas of the porn industry that never really thought about uh, those, design, those marketing strategies. A really great book that describes this is called Vibrator Nation by Lynn Camella. So, okay, so marketing strategies are changing. We have one back there, and then we'll come down here. Go ahead. So as a follow-up question to what he asked, yeah. he was ascertained that you create, or on the site of your identity creates a browser identity for you. Mm -hmm. so this might be naive, as I believe most people browse porn in private mode or incognito mode. How does one create a browser history that could not store cookie-wise or history-wise your history? Um, so you're saying they browse it, like, say, in Chrome on the... Um, on the, that mode where it's not collecting your browsing pattern? Is that what you're saying? Well, the first thing I would say is I think probably more porn is being consumed in public than you imagine, um, tr truly. I, I mean, whether we uh, want to admit that or not, um, it's not hard uh, in the New York subway to have glanced across the subway station and found somebody on a mobile device looking at things. Um, there's probably a lot more 
porn, uh, you know, sent in text messages and through sexting than we might want to admit. Um, but to answer your question, I mean, uh, I don't know that most people, I think the average person doesn't even know how to get rid of cookies or, or, or um, to go into that mode on Chrome. I, I actually think that that takes a certain level of technical knowledge, believe it or not, that most people, I don't, I, my father wouldn't even know what a cookie is, right? <laughs> He'd be totally confused by that and why would they call it that? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I know that sounds like crazy, but the vast majority of consumers, right, in, uh, uh, of really anything, don't have that, I don't think have that level of technical knowledge. So yes, if you do have that level of technical knowledge, there are lots of ways around this. Um, and then the other thing I'd just add quickly is to say that um, the, browsing, uh, the browsing data they have is not just of their sites. They buy and sell browsing data to third parties just like so many other companies, and it's one of their major revenue streams. Yeah, I mean, you know, Facebook wants to know what porn you're looking at too, even if they don't let you look at porn on, or, you know, upload porn to Facebook. Yeah, um, you mentioned that MindGeek is a uh, streaming service and not a pornography service, and that made me wonder, uh, is there a stigma, do you think that there's a stigma against pornography in the tech industry? Like, for example, if mm. I work for an algorithm for Pornhub or whatever, and then tried to get a job at Google, let's say, and like apply this knowledge, uh, do you think that they would be willing to like transfer, like uh, have that same job? Yeah, so I, that's a great question. Um, so I've talked to a lot of people who either currently or formerly worked for one of the MindGeek companies, but particularly Pornhub. And um, I would say um, half of them have like are totally proud of working there and have no problem with the fact that they're part of porn. Um, another half um, certainly articulate themselves as working in the tech industry, and their company just happens to only have pornographic content. Um, and I think that what's going on there isn't, I mean, it's partly maybe a defensiveness about what they do, but I also actually think that um, what's going on there is a way of distancing yourself from an industry so you don't have to think about its politics and its political economy. I think there's a way in which they, um, there is definitely more prestige and power associated with technology and certainly more money associated with the tech industry. Uh, I mean, MindGeek starts out because a, a guy goes to Deutsche Bank and gets a $300 million line of credit by saying he wants to start a tech company that buys up all these video streaming sites. Meanwhile, a sex worker can't get a checking account, right? Um, so I think partly it's prestige, partly it's defensiveness, and partly it's about like distancing oneself from answering questions about this industry, or even having to know about how these videos are made. And one of the things I find really fascinating about some of the folks that work there is a lot of people who work there is that they really have no idea how the production side of the industry works at all. These films just come to them in the mail or write in email and they uh, edit it and write, create basically what we see out of it. Yeah, down here. Who would you recommend um, to read um, that has a focus on the effect of the porn industry on human on, um, sexual, um, well, human sexuality, um, uh, sexual development. Um, I'm thinking of like teens, preteens, seeing hmm. this stuff and its effect on their sexuality as adults. More yeah. of psychology. Um, I mean, th so there's a long history of communication scholars, sociologists, anthropologists studying, um, I guess, the pedagogical aspects of porn. Um, and there isn't really, and there's never been, a, they've never been able to prove a causal relation between what you see and then what you do. And um, there's a lot of ways in which I think porn is taken up pedagogically that doesn't have that kind of um, direct um, mimicry then in real life. It's not that you don't learn from it, but it's not to, it's to say that what, you, what you're taking up with that can, um, be taken up in other ways or more playful ways or, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's not a complete, like, I see this, so I'm going to do this, right? But that's not to say that people aren't learning from it in, in kind of, in, in, a, in a variety of ways. So is that what you're asking? Well, I'm, I'm, 
I, I guess in a way, except um, I would agree with you, except I think that when um, you're a preteen or a teen and you're, you're seeing this, there's got to be an effect on that, ch that child and young adult's sexuality, especially um, if they're um, involved in some of the aberrant forms of, I guess, sexuality, for lack of better words. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's got to be some sort of critical window of time in, 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 a, in a young adult's life where this would have an effect dependent upon hours and hours of seeing this. Yeah, well, I, I would never deny the effect that porn has effects, but it's just hard to determine what those are, right? It's really hard to determine what those are individually or even in a sort of broader sense. There are people who study it. One book that I would point you that sort of traces the genealogies of some of these um, studies around effects of porn is actually a book called, um, like, I think it's just called uh, pornography, feminist, Feminism and Pornography, or Pornography and Fem Feminism, and it was edited by um, uh, um, Drusilla Cornell. And it starts sort of with studies that begin in the 70s and 80s and traces some of the debates that happen around those studies. So I, that's, I guess, the first place I'd go. Yeah, up here. Me? Yeah. Oh. So I've got three questions that all tie into each other, so I'll play you. Okay. One arching thing. So uh, <coughs> the first one is all these companies are owned by the same umbrella company. Nope. I try, so I would say 80% of the streaming companies are owned by an umbrella company, but there's some that have been holdouts that have refused to sell. There's a couple. So I included those um, partly because they're big but also because they allow us to not just talk about one company. But it's hard not to talk about one company when they've got a monopoly. But go ahead, sorry. I, I, I was a little, well, I don't know how that puts my first question, because um, I was thinking, like, are, do all these, like, because all these companies kind of do, like, I know with, like, X Hamster and Pornhub, they're all kind of owned by the same. X Hamster is actually one of the ones that isn't. So X Hamsters and X Video are not owned by MindGeek. Those are, the, those are the two holdouts from my talk. Yeah, they have refused to sell. So all the ones up by but the all the other ones, RedTube, YouPorn, yeah. Why, why, are, why do they exist still if they're under one? Is it to create an idea that there's no monopoly, that there's like still some freedom of monopoly, and then the second one mm -hmm. um, is why did these specific companies that you're talking about become so popular, and then where does most of their revenue come from? OK. so. It's a great question, why keep all of them? Some of that has to do with branding. Some of that has to do with, um, I think, creating the appearance of an abundance of things. They also do have different marketing strategies and different people, even though they're ultimately working for MindGeek, MindGeek different people work on these sites, right? So, um, and they do have a kind of different personality. So one thing that I described in the talk is the way that Xtube, which um, has way more sort of um, homemade porn uploaded to it than Pornhub, or at least that seems to be the impression it's giving based on right, how much homemade porn there seems to be on Xtube. That has a kind of like different, that site has a different personality than Pornhub. So one reason might be to sort of have different sites that have these, that create these kind of different environments for different tastes. I do think some of it also has to do with showing you that there's such an abundance and there's so many options and you just don't realize that probably it's mostly the same, it, or not probably, it is mostly the same company. And then what was your other, was it about just revenue? How did these specific ones get so popular in search and where does most of the revenue come from? How did these get so popular? Um, uh, I mean, I think the idea of having free porn, pirated or not, is a popular idea. Um, no, I mean like these specific ones, not like some other, like why do we not, it's, it's sort of like why does everyone use Google, not Yahoo? Right, so like why is Pornhub so popular? I mean, I will say that Pornhub is really good at marketing itself. I mean, they have a, they have a storefront now in New York, right? In Manhattan, they have their own store. And it's because they realize that retail is a big part of um, right, diversifying their revenue um, income. So, uh, yeah, and they're involved in all kinds of, of stuff, not just retail. So you, you can buy, like, Pornhub hoodies, Pornhub hats. Um, 
Uh, they um, regularly get there. I mean, I have a, one of my many Google alerts for this industry is just Pornhub. And every day a study comes out where it's Pornhub says everybody in Sweden's watching this porn, right? Um, so there's a way in which they've even taken up sort of like rhetorics of, of big data and quantification and the popularity of that um, in a data-driven economy to promote itself. And all of that, I mean, none of that data is verifiable. None of that data is scientifically, you know, right? Uh, um, um, presented, it's all sort of about promoting the company in particular ways, and it's about tapping into um, this, like the, the titillation of um, what a nation might desire. And why it has to be tied to a nation, I don't know, but um, but I think they're just really good at promoting themselves, and I think free porn is a, just a very popular thing. Um, and then revenue sources, it's all over the place. I mean, they. They sell data to third parties. They uh, obviously sell advertisements, uh, advertising space on their sites. Um, and when you have as many people visiting the site as they do, that can be pretty expensive real estate. Um, uh, uh, they license software to people. I've talked to people who do nothing but write the, the sort of technical literature that's supposed to be, that will then get used right, by developers and other companies right, to use that software. So um, yeah, it's retail, it's owning studios, it's um, data, it's um, the licensing of software. Yeah, it's a whole, I mean, they, they've got a really diverse um, revenue stream. All right, I think we can take two more questions. Oh, sorry, my answers are probably too long. No. Oh, you're good. Uh, we'll go down here and then right up here. A visit to the site or goes to the site and they go to browse. It's virtually impossible to browse, I guess, because it invites you Interacting that in the sense takes you by the hand and navigates you around. Yeah. Predicated on previous choices. So why the URI line is it generating a pattern based on probabilities of Yeah, I mean and it's constantly changing. Like your algorithmic identity is constantly changing Same with new input. Individually? But individual visits porn outside. Yeah, it'll be that person somehow anonymized and yeah, I mean, they, yeah, they, they track individual um, browsing uh, patterns based on your sort of IP address and um, other considerations. Yeah, even based on your zip code. I mean, they want to know, they also want to know, I mean, one of the things that zip code tells you is potentially how much money they have if they live in a particular area, right? And so that might, I mean, none of this is, of course, like foolproof, but that might tell you how much disposable income you have. And, um, so there's lots of data that they're sort of collecting on you in order to present content to you. Um, and I mean, there's a really great study that Sophia Noble did of Google. And if you type in black girls into Google, what comes up in different parts of the world and, and with different IP addresses. And um, she did that study over many, many, many years, right? And her book, Algorithms of Oppression, is just like, I think it's coming out this month or it's coming out like next week or something. And that goes into basically some of the ways in which right, these search engines will produce different things for you. Um, based on the kinds of data they've got on you and based on where you are in the world and all kinds of things, yeah. So you can literally write down to the IP address. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is there a bit oh, sorry. Is there a bibliography <laughs> online that we can access? Um, there will there be? There isn't. Yeah, I'll, when the paper gets published, there will be. I was going to say, you have to wait for Patrick's book. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's some references you mentioned along the way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and the videos and the talks recorded, so all you can, yeah. All right, we'll do two more because I know you've been like yeah. itching. So we'll go down here and then in the blue sweater back there and then we'll call it a night. What about you? <laughs> I didn't see you. Where are you? I'm so sorry. If we have time, Patrick, keep your yeah. answers short. <laughs> yeah, and I can, al I can also just hang back for a bit if you want to come up and talk to me individually. Exactly. This is a return to uh, Porn Hub's like, PR campaign and their, their Twitter handle and then talking about what sort of porn people in Sweden aren't talking about. Right. So one thing I've heard is that that is a very good work to destigmatize sex and to make it mm. less um, scary and less uh, make it more talked about. But you just called it titillating, and I think... Um, and from the way you made it sound, do you think that serves to function to make it more stigmatized, to make it like a shock factor, or and which mm. would be better for the company? Um, well, I think 
I think porn, uh, porn companies generally, I mean, even before, uh, right, before the sort of tech boom, um, they were really masters of marketing titillation. And I do think they, I definitely think Pornhub wants um, porn to be talked about more, wants to become more normalized, less taboo. But I think they also understand that titillation is a major draw, right? And I think there's this interesting way in which, just in general, it's held up as a company of a kind of like data-driven capitalist marketplace while also being a source of serious cultural anxiety, and, like pornography generally. And I think there's a way in which their marketing understands both of these things. Look how cool it is that we've got big data. Look how cool that we're a tech company. But also, we understand that we're going to market this in a way that's titillating, that plays on that cultural anxiety. And I think that I actually think pornography has been incredibly clever about um, pornography companies have been incredibly clever about navigating and, and marketing in ways that that both hold up the kinds of myths they want to tell about these companies, and it's kind of like social taboo. Yeah. Um, uh, what is the relationship between a between the uh, porn sites and the advertisers, because there's something just I think we all can even notice from the presentation that porn sites uh, porn sites are interesting in that they only advertise porn content. They only advertise porn content, which seems to sort, of, like, <laughs> sort of like a way to shoot yourself in the foot. Ad, ad wise speaking, is there is that is that a, is that a uh, what have you talked to anyone style, about that stylistic choice? Is that is that is, it, is that an aesthetic choice or is it a monetary choice or is it like my need cross? -border? I mean, the folks who want to advertise are largely porn companies uh, or porn studios. A lot of studios' traffic comes from these sites, and the relationship between those studios and these sites is incredibly complicated because there's so much of those studios' content that is up there illegally that has been pirated and put on online. But they depend so much on the traffic generated from this site that they've been, for, out of economic necessity, forced into a relationship. And they even now, many of these studios, or almost all of them, have their own professional accounts on Pornhub um, so that they can upload their clips directly and work more closely with Pornhub to bring the pri pirated content down. Um, adult novelties are advertised on there and occasionally you do see non-porn advertisements diesel jeans for example there's interesting folks who don't mind their product being affiliated with porn um, you're not going to find maybe chanel on there or some i know somebody who has some sense of themselves as not as above it all um, uh, but uh, but there are companies that actually don't don't mind that and there are um, advertising networking co network companies who act as intermediaries and can create sort of packages for companies about what kinds of sites you'll be advertised on. So like if you're a big company that does lots of online advertising and you'll, you'll pay somebody to sort of you know, craft the kind of sites that you'll be advertised on it's sort of like that, that fit your brand, right? Patrick, shall we, wait, shall we end with one sure. last one yeah. from the balcony? Okay. Yes. Oh, no problem. <laughs> about you know Facebook wanting to know this information and um, how behind the screen there's more integration of porn in our lives than maybe socially accepted. So by comparison, would you say that it is more integrated behind the screen or you know the incorporation of, of sex into all of our marketing and television but not necessarily porn and sex work? Um, mm. And just by comparison, you know, behind the screen what's in our regular face-to-face -face social lives? Um, yeah, I mean... I, I just think that porn is a central part of our culture. And um, I mean, you don't even, and, and you don't even need to necessarily point to just how much revenue it generates. Um, uh, um, uh, so yeah, I guess the way I would answer that question is to say that um, it's more than just big business. It's, it's also this, I think, really um, like kind of intimate social shared cultural form um, that happens in ways that are that exceed even these companies. Does that answer your question or cuz I don't know if I full, fully understood the question. I don't know the full of okay. Um, <laughs> I, I guess I'm just trying to um, assist by comparison, you know, we have we we can tell how much sexuality and pornography is integrated into our society that of that we live in. But, you know, as you were saying with like Facebook want to know what type of porn we watch how much integration and overlap in our lives where we wouldn't normally have that overlap and in an acceptable fashion in real life, mm -hmm. how much of it is actually just 
over encompassing each other behind the screen and with you know the metadata and all this data mining that's you know being sold from mm -hmm. one place to another, is it that much greater, or is it you know roughly the same, give or take, in different areas where it could be you know way different? Oh gosh, I don't know. I mean, um, I I I don't think I have an answer other than to say. Um, um, I do think it's pretty ubiquitous, and I think that um, when it comes to selling data to third parties, I think the more I think at the moment they want a lot of data on you. I mean, the CAM sites, the folks who work for the CAM sites that I talk to, um, even the CAM models. When you're when you're talking to a CAM model, a bunch of data about the viewer, about their client, comes up, including where they're watching from, what device they're watching from, estimated income, how much they've already spent at the site, potential for future spending. Mm -hmm. Like all of that's there. So that they can determine whether or not you're worth their time. Mm -hmm. uh, or what, they sh what other kind of models you've looked at. I mean, they try to create, pro they tr and one of the CAM models basically said, the more data we can get, the better. So that's so. kind of comparable to like CRM with you know, non companies. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They're they're part of the the, the broader data, um, the data economy. Yeah. So like my grocery store that wants to market towards me, also gonna find out like, you know, what kind of firm I'm um, <laughs> Potentially. <laughs> All right. I think with that, we're gonna close out for the night. Thank you, Patrick. <laughs>